from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, Airbnb says not just a travel recovery, but a travel revolution is happening, and that business and leisure travel will be forever changed. Plus, that it's opening new economic opportunities for women. CEO Brian Chesky will be my guest. Plus, Disney shares sink the most since May. As CEO Bob Chapek gave investors some unsettling guidance during an event for Goldman Sachs and a rare event for Netflix, the company on the verge of making one of its biggest deals ever to buy the catalog of British novelist Roald Dahl. We'll get to all things streaming in a bit. And how COVID is changing the future of tech investing. I'm speaking exclusively with Revolution CEO Steve Case about how innovation is moving to middle America and beyond. All that ahead, but first I want to take a look at the markets with Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta in New York. And Kriti, we saw a lot of movement in just the last few minutes of trade. What was happening there? Well, it's interesting, Emily, because we came into today with a pretty strong bounce in futures, a lot of green on the screen, and then it kind of faded to a point where we ended flat on the day. What's interesting is a lot of people are saying, well, you're going to have the buy the dip mentality really show up. And here's where you saw that tug of war between the bulls and the bears, the bulls wanting to buy that dip and really continue that recovery trade the bears saying well hold on a second the selling that seasonality is still a factor and you have to go into the FOMC tomorrow so a lot of that is positioning but what really led the trade was those big tech stocks as you can see with the New York Bank index ending higher by 0.6 percent even treasuries a little bit of a bid there with a uh, yield or I should say bid lower uh, with the yields uh, up 1.1 percent but let's talk about the tech trade as a whole because it wasn't just big tech that rallied throughout the day you saw it really become that big tech bundle trade that we've been talking about. So whether it was Chinese ADRs, which of course have been under pressure for quite a bit, those in the green by over half a percent and as semiconductors, NASDAQ biotech, even to the point where uh, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, those were in the green as well. So pretty significant to see that tech bundle trade was really doing well today. What wasn't doing well, Emily? Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies actually lagging the broader market for most of the session, which brings me to how they're really reacting to stocks in general, because today they weren't on the same page, but that hasn't been the historical trend. This is a correlation that really shows that, that trend is building higher and higher. What does that mean for stocks? It means that pain trade, that volatility. Well, if it's correlated to Bitcoin, it could mean that there is a little bit more volatility in the future of the S&P 500. That's the macro picture, Emily. Let's get to the micro with Ed Ludlow. Yes, yeah, some of big tech really held momentum into the close of Tuesday session. Case in point, Uber up 11.5% on Tuesday. Biggest game since November 4th, 2020. The company is saying that adjusted EBIT in the third quarter will be between a loss of $25 million and a $25 million profit. In other words, they're tracking for a quarterly profit a quarter earlier than previously stated. Of course, that's a milestone we've been waiting, Emily, for a long time for from this company. That's the gainers on the decliner front, Activision Blizzard. That two-day decline that we've seen in Activision Blizzard taking the stock to its lowest level since June 2020. Of course, the catalyst being they disclosed a probe by the SEC into workplace practices. Compounding that, you now have top executives departing from the company. So a real eye on this company as it navigates some pretty difficult times in the gaming industry. Interesting to see where investors went today. I don't know if this is a case of buy the dip or if there are just some favorite picks, but Twitter, one of the best performers on the S&P 500 on Tuesday, up pretty significantly the most since late July, 3%. But it wasn't really translated into any other of the social media stocks. You can see Facebook up just a half a percent and Google parent Alphabet up just two tenths of 1%. But actually, in a market that kind of gave up by the end of the session, you do see big tech doing well, as Critty said. Emily. All right, Ed, thanks so much. Sticking with top tech, Google employees are pushing back on the search engine giant's handling of the Russian election. Employees have joined politicians and activists blasting the company for pulling a voting app for Russia's opposition leader, a move critics say caves into the Kremlin. Apple removed the app 
as well. For more, I want to bring in Bloomberg Tech's Mark Gurman and Kurt Wagner, who've both been following this story. Mark, I'll start with you. Look, uh, this app was created by allies of, of Alexei Navalny, uh, of course, opposition to President Putin. Have we seen something like this before from Apple and Google in Russia in particular, or is this a new threshold? This is a unique circumstance, right? Apple has been under fire and faced some criticism for certain app removals uh, in China. They've removed in the past the New York Times. They removed other applications. They've even shut down their own media stores, some of the media stores in China. But in terms of Russia, uh, this is a, a newer situation. Obviously, Navalny, it's, it's a, you know, very significant. So this is gathering a lot of headlines. Uh, a few months ago, we saw Apple follow a new policy from Russia where Russia wants some of its government-issued apps or apps made by Russian developers highlighted when you install or set up a new iPhone. So Apple worked uh, with Russia to implement those guidelines. But in terms of this specific situation, you know, it's a hot button issue and this is definitely uh, a, a, a new stone, a new stepping now, stone here. There are concerns that this could have a deep impact on the Russian election itself. Facebook, Kurt, also under pressure from uh, the Russian government since the arrest of Navalny. Talk to us about the status of that, facing some pretty big fines. Yeah, well, Russian regulators are saying that if companies like Facebook, like Google, do not uh, remove content that they deem to violate local law, those companies could be fined between 5 and 20 percent of their local revenue. And so uh, that is not insignificant. Obviously, uh, Facebook, for example, oftentimes does take down content if it violates local law or it at least restricts the content in that area. For example, Russia is actually a, a pretty regular requester of this type of thing. It was almost 2,000 pieces of content that uh, Facebook restricted in Russia in the back half of last year. Compare that in the U.S., there are only 12 pieces of content. So it kind of gives you a sense of how often this does happen in Russia. But yes, these fines could be a big deterrent for companies that are trying to walk that line of leaving stuff up, trying to, to you know, support free speech, but also operate in countries where that's not necessarily always very easy. Google took a big stand in 2010, nearly exiting from China, pulling almost all of its services. But we haven't seen the company or any of these companies take a stand like that since. Um, you know, there are concerns, Mark, that uh, Russia could be the next China for these big tech companies. But also these companies are facing government scrutiny around the world, you know, not just in Russia. Have we heard anything from Apple in particular about this Russia situation? Are, are you expecting to see more, more incidents like this? Yeah, Apple and Google haven't commented officially uh, on the matter. For Apple, Russia is not a major market. It's not one of its big areas. Android is the bigger operating system right now in Russia, so it's potentially more of an issue for Android phone makers, not Google as a company, but devices that use the Google Play Store, Google, uh, devices that run Android, Samsung devices, LG devices, uh, what have you. But what we have here is a potential domino effect, right? We saw China. Now we're seeing some of these same circumstances crop up in Russia. You know, Apple has already given iCloud data up to a company in China that many have said are associated with the Chinese government. They have made concessions in China. And you're seeing a similar pattern begin to develop in Russia. Who knows what the next country is going to be? Apple maintains it follows the local laws in, in the geographies where it does business. The question is, is removing this app really mean that they're complying with local laws? Or does this mean they're complying with the request from the Kremlin? At least in China, what you see is these are laws, these are regulations that they're following. Uh, the App Store issue with the default Russian apps for the iPhone, that was a local law that they were complying with. But this seems to be a, a new area, and I'm going to be interested to see if there continues to be this Apple-Russia dialogue. There continues to be changes to the way Apple devices are used in Russia uh, because of the Kremlin. Meantime, Kurt, Facebook facing a battering of investigative stories here at home by the Wall Street Journal, talking about the failure of Facebook moderation efforts, talking about the company and executives uh, neglecting negative effects of the, the social media platforms on teenagers, on Instagram, on Facebook. Facebook has responded this, to this story now multiple times. There was a statement out over the weekend, another one out today. What is Facebook saying? Well, today Facebook tried to show people 
hey, we actually care about safety, we actually care about security. All of these stories are kind of painting us as someone who ignores these problems, but really look at what we're doing. So they shared a few new stats today. They said, we've spent $13 billion on safety and security since the 2016 election. Uh, they said that they now have 40,000 employees, including content moderators who work on safety and security. You know, this is their way of basically saying, look, we are investing in these problems, even though uh, you know people don't think that we are. Now, my takeaway from this is kind of like, well, if you are putting what feels like a significant investment behind this, and yet you're still having all of these content problems, um, you know, what does that mean? Are these problems fixable, right? I think that's the question that I've really started to ask over the last week or so is like, can Facebook actually do this? They've often talked about using AI and, and technology to automate this process, but clearly, despite all of the investment they've made, a bunch of stuff continues to slip through the cracks. And so I think they have some, some real issues here um, and the fact that they're spending as much as they are and still not fixing those issues to me is a major red flag. All right, and an ongoing uh, issue that we've been following here for years. Uh, Kurt Wagner, Mark Gurman, thank you both so much for those updates. Meantime, Facebook has introduced a portable version of its Portal video chat device. The product is called Portal Go. It comes with a 10-inch screen and a rechargeable battery, so it doesn't need to stay plugged into a wall. Also comes with a $199 price tag, but that may not be enough to convince shoppers. Many tablets on the market already have these same capabilities. Coming up, we're going to hear from Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky about the future of travel. Is a revolution really happening before our very eyes? That's next. This is Bloomberg. The world's not going back to, to the way it was in 2019 any more than it's not going back to the way it was in 1950. And if that's the case, then travel is not going back to the way it was. The CEOs of some of the world's biggest travel companies are gathering this week in New York for the annual Skift Global Forum. They will be discussing the future of travel in a post-pandemic world. Airbnb also saying today it's now welcomed more than 1 billion guests and that long-term stays are continuing to grow. Earlier, I sat down with Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky and asked why he thinks this isn't just a travel recovery, but a travel, as he calls it, revolution. Well, number one, there's going to be a huge shift from business travel to leisure travel. Business travel is not coming back in a big way in the next year because technology has replaced a lot of the need for business travel. But the more people are at home, the more they want to travel. But they're going to go everywhere. They're going to travel to like kind of cities, small towns, and rural communities. Now, hopefully next year, cross-border will recover. Once cross-border recovers, you're going to see a whole bunch of people not just traveling abroad, but even living abroad. And I also think summers are going to be more and more frequently times people go away and work remotely. Let's go out a couple of years. You have repeatedly said that travel will never be the same. I've spoken to the CEO of Expedia who says travel is going to go back to the way it was, even business travel. Why am I getting such different opinions? Well, I, the world's not going back to, to the way it was in 2019 any more than it's not going back to the way it was in 1950. And if that's the case, then travel is not going back to the way it was. This is the worst technology will ever be in our lifetime. It's only going to improve. So the world is going to continue to get more flexible. People are going to continue to have more options. And you're going to, we're going to start to live in a world where all you have to believe is people don't go back to the office five days a week. And that some business travel is curbed. If you believe those two things, then travel is never going to come back the way it was. It's going to be different. Now, I do think there's going to be a new golden age of travel. It's just going to be really different. You've told Airbnb employees they can work from home until September of next year. You've got other huge tech companies looking at January 2022. Are other companies getting this wrong? Are they getting wrong how bad COVID is going to be? You know, I think that um, ultimately the employees, not the employers, will probably dictate the work policies down the road. Because every one of us, all the CEOs, want to hire the very best talent to be competitive. And I think after compensation, flexible work policies will probably be the number one benefit for employees. So I don't think we're going to all live in a world that's 100% remote, but I don't think we're going to live in a world where most people have to come back to the office most of the time. And the younger the company, the more they're likely to embrace a hybrid or even more remote model. So I think the world, the trend is going to be more flexible. As we can do more, tech, more things over technology, the physical environment becomes more flexible. 
Interesting. Now, there are big concerns about women backsliding in the pandemic, yeah. losing the gains they've made at home and work. More than 55% of Airbnb hosts are women. Do you expect it, that to continue it, to go up? I think it will probably continue or go up. I mean, one of the most amazing stats about Airbnb is this next one. Since we started Airbnb, women on the platform have earned $70 billion. I think this is an incredible opportunity for women um, on Airbnb. And the number one in two professions on Airbnb for hosts are school teachers and healthcare workers. So this is, I think, an incredible leveling the playing field because there is no inherent advantage. Uh, you know, everyone has an equal opportunity. Now, party houses became a problem during COVID and Airbnb put a ban on parties at all of its listings. You're now working to share information with VRBO about repeat party house offenders to try to clamp down. Is the ban working? And how long do you expect this to continue? I mean, do you think uh, you'll keep this ban in place for the long term? Well, we'll certainly keep this ban in place for the time being because we don't want to be a disturbance to communities. We want to strengthen the communities we're in. The ban is absolutely working. We have significantly fewer incidents and reports than we did a year or two ago. So we're going to continue to develop new tools. We also, in addition to having a ban, we have really good technology tools to detect um, through a variety of heuristics whether or not somebody's throwing a party. So we're continually improving our ranking algorithms to, you know, our algorithms to detect high risk reservations. Meantime, Airbnb recently announced it will allow sexual assault survivors to sue the company rather than go into mandatory arbitration. These are incidents involving Airbnbs in particular. You've called on other companies to do the same here. You know, Uber and Lyft share information about dangerous drivers. Would Airbnb be willing to share information about dangerous listings with VRBO and Expedia? Well, I mean, absolutely. We're already doing a party bans, and we could, of course, go further. I think the most important principle is pe people in our community safe and prioritize the rights of survivors. And so anything we can do to be able to help people feel like Airbnb is a safe community, it's safe for Airbnb to be in your community, is something that we will prioritize. Now, you were really bullish on experiences pre-COVID and then virtual yeah. experiences during COVID. How has that business evolved? Do you still see that being Airbnb's potential next big thing? How will it stack up to homes ultimately? Hard to know how it will stack up to homes. I'm incredibly bullish. I mean, we had to take a pause in experiences because people couldn't gather. But increasingly, a lot of physical activities people were doing don't you know are not like making it through the pandemic and i think increasingly people are realizing they can only stay home so many nights and watch netflix they eventually have to get out of the house and do things to other people and i think we're going to be a nice alternative to going to a restaurant or netflix occasionally whether you're traveling or in your own city you can do a really interesting activity with a local expert so i'm very bullish on this uh, opportunity in the next few years Airbnb was diversifying in so many other ways before the pandemic. Yeah. Also content, flights, business travel. As the homes business have res has resurged, you're, you're going through this travel recovery slash revolution. H have you talked about reigniting any of those earlier ambitions or are you looking at other potential mini moonshots that are completely different? You know, one of the great things um, about uh, one of the opportunities you have in a crisis is you can really like you know really get much more focused and in this crisis this past year we got really focused got back to our roots of really connecting guests and hosts and providing connection and so we've gotten really focused on our core business you know we're still focused a lot on experiences we don't have near-term plans to restart any of the things that any of the other opportunities like flights or content that we paused never say never in the future but we are really focused on providing accommodations and providing great experiences for people what about new other uh, potential lines of business? I mean, I know you're always experimenting. Yes, absolutely. I mean, like, you know, I am uh, only 40 years old. I plan to be doing this for a long time. I don't want to feel like our biggest innovations are behind us. I think the best innovations at Airbnb are absolutely in front of us. I'm really excited about some things we're working on that I think will come out in the next couple of years. So absolutely, there will be definitely some big new innovations from us. Well, speaking of, you know, innovative approaches, Airbnb is offering free temporary housing to 20,000 Afghan refugees. I know that you are paying for part of this personally. You've had a lot of hosts step up. Give us yeah. a status update on those efforts. 
Yeah, so we've had an overwhelming response um, to this effort. Um, you know, we've committed to house 20,000 Afghan refugees for free. And we've had a number of other people step in, want to provide housing. So we've got thousands of hosts providing housing. We've housed about 700 people so far, but I anticipate we'll be able to certainly house the 20,000 we made a commitment to house. I would love for us to house even more. And so we can house about as many people as people are willing to uh, host. So if anyone's watching and they want to house an Afghan refugee, you can go to airme.org and you know put up your place. It only takes 10 or 20 minutes to list. And the one thing I want everyone to know if they're thinking of housing refugee is number one, they can offer to house them for free, but if they want, we'll pay for the stay. Number two, we work with resettlement agencies like the International Rescue Committee and the World Church Service. These are professional agencies that will do the screening of the refugees to make sure that you are ready to take them in. So they are that's what they do. We will match you. And I think this is just one of the biggest humanitarian crisis of our lifetime. So hopefully everyone can help us step up. Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky there speaking on the sidelines of the Skift conference opening later today. Wednesday, we're going to be joined by Uber CEO Dara Khosra Shahi. He'll be joining from the same event, and you can catch that interview live 10.30 a.m. Wall Street time, 7.30 here on the West Coast. Coming up, Disney shares sinking the most since May on a cautious update from CEO Bob Chapek. After the break, we'll take you to, to L.A. to get all the details. This is Bloomberg. All right, take a look at Disney shares. It had its steepest drop since May, following comments from CEO Bob Chapek warning that movie and TV production delays could impact subscriber growth this quarter. For more, we are joined by Bloomberg Chris Palmieri from LA, who listened into the whole conversation. So, Chris, this seemed to take investors by surprise. What exactly did Chapek say? Well, he said that the new subscribers they add this current quarter are going to be in the low single digit millions. So, you can maybe envision, say, 3 million. And Wall Street had been anticipating a number of something like 10 million. It was going to maybe grow to 126 million Disney Plus subscribers. So that's a big difference. He cited three things. One is, as you mentioned, COVID, uh, you know, the surge of the Delta variant has meant they couldn't produce some things. If you're a Disney Plus subscriber, you've been kind of saying, yeah, all I get is Turner and Hooch. Um, and <laughs> a couple of other things. Last month, they launched um, a new Star Plus product, which is sort of their... Uh, more adult-oriented, Hulu-like product in Latin America hasn't been going at quite the take-up they had hoped. And also in India, some promotional uh, plans uh, uh, ended, and they didn't. They don't immediately. Your credit card doesn't immediately get taken up again over there, and so uh, so the subscriber um, additions are a little weaker than planned. All right, interesting. We're going to have to continue to watch the fallout from that. Chris Palmieri, thank you for the update. Coming up, we're going to talk about the supply chain dilemma. That is next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. The logistics industry is dealing with the worst supply chain crisis in decades, and it's affecting almost everything in all corners of the globe. Bloomberg's Brendan Murray explains. There is just a lot of demand right now for uh, for products, whether those be uh, items for our home office or for backyard entertainment. Uh, this has been a consistent uh, issue uh, for the past year or so throughout various lockdowns. The global supply chain is made up of ships and trains and trucks, and it's designed for predictable patterns of demand, uh, which is the exact opposite of what we have right now. A lot of uncertainty about uh, whether certain economies are going to be open or closed based on the outbreaks that they're having. So we're just seeing a lot of confusion, a lot of chaos, and a lot of uncertainty uh, disrupt the whole system. The auto industry is very reliant on on semiconductors, uh, these memory chips that are in basically everything we buy uh, that has sort of an electronic component to it. And, and there they come from certain economies in Asia, like Taiwan, where they're having trouble meeting the demand. 
The, the supply chain issues are going to be around as long as you think the virus is going to be around. First or second quarter of 2022 is when a lot of people see the normalizing of all the shipping and transportation disruptions that we're seeing. But um, if they don't, we're, we might be dealing with this for another year or two or three. Bloomberg's Brendan Murray there now for a deep dive on the numbers behind the confusion, chaos and uncertainty in the supply chain. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow with us now for more at the plasma. Ed, talk to us about just how bad the supply chain constraints continue to be. Yeah, well, we have record number of container ships literally anchored outside the port of Los Angeles, America's busiest port. Actually, 73 as of Sunday night. It came down by about three over the course of 24 hours. But simply, they cannot get the containers off the ships fast enough. Why? COVID restrictions. Why? Because of labor shortages. That's the companies actually handling the shipping. What about the customers who are paying to have their items moved? Well, come with me into my Bloomberg terminal and look at what is a pretty staggering chart. The cost of shipping for these guys has gone through the, the roof. It is rocketed. You can see there the blue line. While volumes of shipping have remained pretty steady, that's the white line. There are so many factors at play here, but one is simply that demand, as Brendan pointed out, remains elevated. But there are so many constraints that are limiting carri carrier's ability to move things, particularly when it comes to semi-truck or hauling freight on roads and also by rail. But there's also opportunity for investors, right? Some of the best performing stocks in the world have been container liners. Look at this chart, the orange line, the Bloomberg Intelligence Index of global container liner peers has drastically outperformed the S&P 500. The S&P 500 doesn't even really register compared to this 220% gain we've seen. The question, does that continue? And all analysts point to, of course, the holiday season. So many people like e-commerce giants like Amazon, Walmart are ramping up, getting ready for this heavy demand around the holiday period. And that, too, is impacting an already constrained supply chain. Emily. All right, Ed, don't go anywhere because in the last few minutes, as we've been on air, Bitcoin slipped below $40,000 and then shot way back up, now above $41,000. What do you imagine is happening here? Yeah, there's two things at play. We saw this risk off mentality in the markets Monday with the equity market sell off. That took Bitcoin with it. It's falling for a third consecutive day below that 40,000 technical level. That's a point of stress that the market was looking to. But you also have growing regulatory voices, right? The SEC chair, Gary Genzer, commenting on Tuesday that others have tried alternative currencies before. Private companies like banks have tried alternative means of exchange before and they haven't worked. That's growing to pressure alongside that risk off mode that we've seen in the market so far this week. Emily. And clearly some investors buy in the dip. Okay, Ed, thanks so much for that insight. I want to get back to the digital freight market and the digital freight startup Transfix, which has announced it's going public via SPAC. The merger could value the company at $1.1 billion. And as Ed just told us, this comes at a time when the logistics industry is under a lot of pressure. Joining me now, Transfix president and CEO Lily Chen. Uh, Lily, let's start with the, the pain points out there that still exist in the supply chain. Give us the big picture. Obviously, we know the pandemic snarled the supply chain. A lot of us couldn't get what we wanted and needed. What are the problems that exist right now? Absolutely. So we're still continuing to see demand peaks. Um, you know, we were seeing capacity shortages. There's labor congestion uh, and uh, facility congestion as well. Uh, you know, this is one of the big reasons why customers and carriers really work with Transfix. You know, we've built a platform that's really enabled customers and carriers to be able to navigate uh, all market conditions, quite frankly, and that's really led to the growth and the growth of our business. So uh, talk to us about how Transfix steps in. You are working to smooth out some of the kinks in the chain. How does the technology work? Absolutely. We connect some of the largest shippers in the world with carriers across the country. We work with companies such as Target, Unilever, and Wayfair, and we've built an incredibly strong and growing community of carriers. And 93% of the carriers uh, on our platform continue to come back and use Transfix. Our technology has enabled us to be able to provide customers with easier access and far more reliable capacity, and at the same time, being able to provide carriers with access to the loads that they're looking for that's going to be good for them as well as their drivers. Why SPAC? Why now? It's a great question. Uh, this is the time. We have incredible momentum in the business. We have been able to prove every single year that we have grown the business with new customers, uh, growing customers, a carrier base, and increased and increased improvements in our automation. 
We have an incredible partner with G Squared Ascend One. They've been investors in Transfix since 2019. Um, they've invested in companies such as Airbnb, Spotify, and Coursera, and are deeply and broadly familiar with the space. And as you know, Emily, uh, there is a lot going on in supply chain. There's a lot of challenges in supply chain, and now is the time for digitalization. So much is still continues to be done manually uh, across, across the entire ecosystem. Um, you know, every party involved in the supply chain continues to do things incredibly manually, and the need for technology and digitalization is now. And we've really built the technology platform and software offerings that's making it easier for shippers and carriers alike. We're heading into the holiday season and peak shipping times. What are you expecting over the next few months? Where are the pain points going to continue to be? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, we expect for demand, the demand peak to continue. Um, and, you know, our, our goal is to really be there simply for our customers. We expect more volatility. And, and, you know, we have proven time and time again that we have been there at the right time, at the right moment. We've worked with uh, one of the largest global consumer brands where, you know, they were actually seeing a lot of facility congestions. And we, we were able, through our technology, to provide uh, pop-up fleets for them instantaneously that really helped them with this pain point. Um, you know, over, over the course of the last year, we've also worked one of the, with one of the high growth fitness brands um, and in the midst of COVID and, and, you know, and even moving forward, helping them with some of the peak, uh, peak demand that they were seeing in the market as well. All right, uh, Transfix president and CEO, Lily Shen, thanks so much for giving us the big picture. Coming up, how the pandemic is creating new opportunities for founders, tech workers, and investors. I'll be speaking exclusively with Revolution Chair and CEO Steve Case ahead of his keynote at the Greenwich Economic Forum. But before that, let's get a look at Stitch Fix fourth quarter net revenue beating estimates. The personal styling platform also announcing the launch of Stitch Fix Freestyle, an online boutique that constantly refreshes according to your preferences. This is Bloomberg. We got hit by the COVID coming, um, and so then we bounced back from, from that. Supply chain problems that we're facing is very traditional economics 101. I see over the medium term, nine negative supply shocks are going to reduce potential growth and increase cost of production over time. We are looking at inflation being more of a short to medium term issue. We didn't take as much risk as we could because we added we added value, but not as much as we should have added. We're 24-7 buying and partnering with the market leaders who are leading digital transformation in their industries. A lot of the funds that we manage are taking much longer term bets, so we feel much less sensitive, you know, maybe to a change in policy. Just some of the big names who joined us on Bloomberg Television throughout the day from the Greenwich Economic Forum, the event offering discussions focused on the transformation of tech and work in a post-COVID world. For more on trends in tech investing and remote work, I want to bring in Revolution Chair and CEO Steve Case for an exclusive interview who's also holding a keynote at the forum later this week. Steve, great to have you back with, back with us. Great of course, the pandemic is dragging on, though there's still a lot of uncertainty. And I'm so curious for your view of the future here. When we look back on this time, what do you think the defining tech trends or inflection points will be of the COVID era? Well, I think this is going to turn out to be kind of a shake the snow globe moment where a lot of things settle out in ways that might surprise us. Some of the trends are pretty clear from the past uh, year, the acceleration of telehealth. We've seen the benefit of companies like Talkspace from Revolution in that. We've seen the benefit of uh, acceleration of e-commerce. Companies like Big Commerce have benefited from that. But I think the bigger story of the longer term story is how we're unbundling how you live and how you work. And that's accelerating a lot of the trends we've been talking about now for a decade around regional entrepreneurship, the, the rise of the rest. And, and so it's really going to be amazing to see what happened. Nobody knows exactly how the, that, that snow globe is going to play out, but clearly there's a lot of rethinking about work itself, how much is going to be hybrid. Uh, some people decided to move to other places. A lot of cities now fighting for talent, just as companies are fighting for talent. There's a battle for talent with, with mayors and, and uh, CEOs all across the, the country. So I think the innovation landscape will look quite different 
10 or 15 years from now, and the pandemic, when we look back, will be one of the catalysts, one of the tipping points that accelerated that. For you as an investor personally, how do you imagine your work, daily life, and investing will be forever changed? Well, one of the things we've been working hard at at Revolution is building a network all across the country. As you know, we've talked about it in the past, the vast majority of venture capital, 75% goes to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. We've actually now invested in 35 states uh, alongside 350 regional venture capitalists. So we've really tried to build this network uh, for Revolution Growth, Revolution Ventures, and the Rise of the Rest uh, Seed Fund. And I think positions as well for what we believe will happen over the next decade. As a result, we have a partnership strategy, really building relationships with local entrepreneurs and, and venture capitalists, uh, and then connecting them as part of this broader network that we're trying to, to build. And we're seeing great momentum in a lot of different cities. A lot of companies really are, are surprising us on the upside. Are there any particular cities across the country in middle America that are exciting from an innovation standpoint, perhaps more so than others? Yeah, but we, we now invest, as I said, a number of states, also over 70 different cities. Uh, so we don't want to pick, it's like asking what's your parent who your favorite <laughs> child is. That, that's difficult. But we have seen a lot of momentum in, in, in a variety of different cities. Just last week in, in Atlanta, for example, there was a $12 billion acquisition of a company there, a MailChimp. That surprised people that, in terms of what was possible in Atlanta. We've saw, seen a lot of big exits in Ann Arbor and Indianapolis and, and Austin and others. And some of our own revolution portfolio companies, there's a lot of momentum for a company focused on sustainable packaging in, in Richmond, Virginia, another company uh, that's doing uh, logistics in Atlanta, this company Freight Waves in Chattanooga that has a kind of like a Bloomberg data platform for the logistics and trucking industry. And since a lot of the big trucking companies are located in Chattanooga, it actually makes more sense for them to be there than to be in, in Silicon Valley. So I think the trends are really moving uh, in favor of a, a more inclusive innovation economy. Sure, Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, a few places will continue to dominate, but I think they'll dominate less in the next decade and I think the pandemic will be part of the reason for that. How do you think cities will survive the pandemic in general? I mean obviously we're seeing more blending with suburbs and beyond but what remains after this? Well there's still a lot of value to cities actually I woke up this morning I was in Washington DC with uh, with uh, your boss Mike Bloomberg and he was of course talking about New York and how wonderful great city and why everybody wants to be in New York or London or one of these great mega superstar cities uh, but there is some value to be clustered as it, for entrepreneurship so uh, while there are always going to be some possibilities around uh, rural uh, entrepreneurship and if the uh, infrastructure bill uh, gets done, which it likely will get done, and rural broadband is funded, that will help a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of places. But we think what will happen over the next decade is instead of just a few cities dominating, a few dozen cities uh, will, uh, will, will stand up. And some of that ties into this point I, I made earlier about the industry expertise, the domain expertise, the partnerships, the trust, the credibility you'll need to disrupt some of these big sectors in ag tech and, and uh, health tech and, and, and so forth will advantage some of the entrepreneurs in, in some of these places if those cities and those companies win the battle uh, essentially for a talent. There's been a brain drain over the last several decades. I think the pandemic has reversed that uh, at least a little bit. I think you're now seeing more venture firms in places like Silicon Valley looking in other parts of the country. I think that will accelerate over the next decade. We've been saying this for a long time. It's great to see it now happening. Speaking of Washington, Congress is considering major changes to tax law that could impact tech founders, early tech employees, uh, QSBS, that QSBS tax break that I'm sure you're familiar with. This would raise taxes on some of these early stock options that tech employees benefit from. There are folks who say this tax will hurt innovation. On the other side, folks say it's, you know, lower taxes than the rest of us pay. Do you think this is fair or not? Well, I think they'll let Congress figure out what, what exactly to do with, in terms of the, the actual package. I think we do need to be careful to make sure while we raise the money we need to fund core national uh, you know, priorities and deal with some of the issues around income inequality, other things that are really quite uh, quite troubling, that we do it in a way that doesn't diminish exactly what we're talking about, the, the willingness for people to invest in young companies, uh, the willingness for entrepreneurs to take the risk of starting uh, you know, companies. So do, we do need to be careful. And things like carried interest, other kinds of things, I, I think it's fair to have it on the table, but it seems like it should be different for, for hedge funds that are trading in sometimes seconds or even private equity funds that are flipping uh, kind of in many cases mature businesses versus these young startups that are backed by uh, venture capital that tend to have a five, sometimes 10 plus year kind of exit horizon. We actually need more capital backing more entrepreneurs in more places. So as this gets uh, you know, negotiated, hopefully there will be an understanding of the need for that. One thing that's encouraging, one of the pieces of legislation now being considered by Congress is to increase the R&D investment for our country 
country and to fund about a dozen regional hubs, significant money uh, that would be funded to help take these cities to the next level, to help these rise of the rest cities rise. So hopefully that will be part of it as well. Anything that helps drive more innovation, drive more job creation and do it, does it in a more inclusive way, bringing along more people and more places, I think would be a good thing. Things that end up, even if well-intentioned, undermining that, obviously it would be a concern. You paused your Rise of the Rest bus store because of COVID, but you're still accepting applications from startups for the seed fund. I believe you've stopped accepting, but you have been accepting submissions and you're about to announce some winners. What are the trends you've seen in the startups that are applying for money quickly? Any, any, any new, fresh ideas that you haven't seen before? Oh, yeah. And some of the companies that we backed through these, you know, we've now done bus tours eight times. To, I think it's 43 different uh, cities. Uh, and some remarkable ideas have emerged and some of those companies are scaling in, in really extraordinary uh, you know, kind of ways. And we've seen that so far. The tour we had to postpone twice, not once, but twice, was taking us to places like Oklahoma City, Wichita, uh, Kansas City. Um, and there really was a lot of Bentonville, Arkansas. And so some of the, the, not surprisingly, some of the businesses being formed there are around the connection to that. Logistics, for example, uh, because of Walmart's presence in, in, uh, in Northwest Arkansas. Ag tech, because that's a major uh, part of what St. Louis is doing. Monsanto being headquartered there. and. and for, for many years. Uh, so we're seeing this next generation of startups building on the expertise and the networks in those cities uh, to really try to disrupt some of those incumbents. And uh, we'll see exactly what happens in terms of when we announce those winners. But I, I think you could expect that some of them will be tied into what is special about those places and what will advantage those places in this next wave if more venture capitalists do focus on other parts of the country and if entrepreneurs who left because there was a sense there was no opportunity there return and the next generation graduating schools stay there i think you'll see more and more of these cities rise up you'll see much more uh, innovation happening all over the country job creation happening all over the country and frankly for all the investors out there uh, when, we, when i talk about this part of this is trying to be uh, almost a point about fairness and leveling the playing field but i also think this is one of the great investment opportunities of all time it's an arbitrage because right. valuations in some places like silicon Valley are much higher than if those same companies were in other parts of the country. So from an investor standpoint, it makes a lot of sense to, to, to really focus on what's happening everywhere, not just what's happening in your own backyard. Okay. Well, Steve, we can always count on you to give us a bitter, bigger picture of what's happening across the country. Steve Case, Revolution Chair and CEO. Thanks for stopping by. All right. Coming up, how the streaming wars have moved from the screen to the speaker. We'll talk about the industry's latest experiment next. This is Bloomberg. The fintech startup Revolut is planning to offer commission-free stock trading to U.S. customers. It is the British company's latest effort to expand. Revolut launching money transfer and budget services in the U.S. last year. It is one of the well-funded fintechs that's muscling into areas once reserved for banks and brokerages. Meantime, the streaming wars continuing to stay hot and not just on your screens. This week, HBO Max launched Batman, the audio adventures, a new scripted podcast featuring several prominent actors playing characters from Gotham City. Joining us now are Bloomberg media and entertainment reporter Lucas Shaw. Lucas, tell us about the new Batman. Well, this is all part of a plan that we're seeing kind of across the different streaming services right now of developing the companion podcast shows that go with ongoing TV shows or that are related to properties that you have so that you can keep those customers, those viewers engaged care. I mean, we're in this moment now where there are so many different TV shows and also, frankly, so many different podcasts that anything you can do to kind of create this multi, you know, multimodal universe of content uh, seems appealing to them. We've seen it with, with this Batman show, with HBO Max, Apple ha had one, uh, Netflix is developing original podcasts, and, and this is happening all over Hollywood. Meantime, Lu uh, you have a huge scoop out about Netflix nearing a deal to buy the Roald Dahl catalog. We're talking about classics like Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, James and the Giant Peach, and an acquisition of this size is a rare event for Netflix. What do we know? Yeah, this would be the biggest acquisition that Netflix has made to date. Uh, they, they, there's not a purchase price disclosed, but it's safe to assume that it's at the very least hundreds of millions of dollars. 
you know, this is this is a sign. You know, the, the type of acquisition that Netflix has always been interested in is one where they're buying IP, right? They don't want to buy a legacy media company that owns TV networks or owns studios, has lots of infrastructure. They just want the IP that they can use to make TV shows, make movies, and maybe make toys and lunchboxes and all those things. And, and in that regard, Roald Dahl is kind of perfect because it's a you know, the Roald Dahl story company employs like two dozen people. It's basically just this great catalog of, of kids properties. Now, the real question, of course, is mo many of these properties have been turned into film and TV shows already, so what are going to be the, the new spins that Netflix has that makes this worth it for them in the long term? Right, and quickly, do you think they'll be making more big buys like this, to, you know, to get the IP behind, <laughs> you know, future content? They have always talked down the possibility of making clear that they'd rather, you know, rather build than buy. Uh, mm. I think if they can find other assets like this, they will absolutely acquire. But, you know, Netflix's strategy seems to change right. ever so slightly all the time. There was a, a story earlier today that they might just be interested in global okay. sports rights at some point in the future. All right. Well, a rare event indeed. Thanks so much, Lucas, for bringing us that reporting. We'll be looking out for that deal if it happens. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Tech. Make sure to tune in tomorrow. We'll be joined by Uber CEO Dara Khosrowshahi, plus the CEO of Genentech and Mark Mahaney of Evercore. Out with a new report. I'm Emily Chang.